Arriving in Bolton after a spell at the GPO, where he edited Coalface, William Coldstream was invited to paint the city with his colleague Graham Bell. However, their kind of meticulous realism proved impossible in the busy streets of the town. The bustle of Bolton defied on-the-spot depiction, so the two painters had to retreat to the roof of the art gallery, where they could paint the view in serene perspective. When Coldstream and Graham Bell stood on top of the roof and made their pictures of Bolton, they were, in fact, distant from the population. People realised this. Now, how do you get round that? One solution, and this was done by Julian Trevelyan, who went up to Bolton to, to make pictures, was to do collages on the spot, in the streets, surrounded by people, and to use as a, as a resource for making your pictures, not paint, but to tear up magazine images, newspaper headlines, and put this together. And that gives, I think, much more of a social slice of popular imagery, which would have contact with um, a more day-to-day -day mentality than the long-distance European tradition views of Coldstream and Bell. Coming down off the roof, abandoning the long-distance view in favour of a more direct involvement with people's lives, had its counterpart in Grierson's film movement. There's a job going in the city, which I think it's you, but the job's in, actually in the provinces. It's a representative public school type, and I think you'd suit. Housing problems, made for the British Commercial Gas Association, abandoned idealised images of the worker for interviews with slum dwellers. In the words of John Grierson's sister, Ruby, who worked on the film, the camera's yours, the microphone's yours. Now tell the bastards what it's like to live in the slums. Of course, uh, I don't suppose people realise what it really is to be tied up in a run room and cannot get anything any better. We are only hoping that the council will liven their ideas up and get their minds made up to get the flats ready so that every working class man will have hygienic flats to live in. Where the cooking conditions is better, the living accommodation is better, sleeping accommodation is better, and what's more, you have a bath. Housing problems is usually credited to Edgar Anstey and Arthur Elton, but actually Ruby Grierson's contribution to the film was enormous. She helped relax the people that you see on the screen and she was more interested in getting to the truth of the situation rather than in stylized shots. Housing Problems is also extraordinary in terms of the technological achievement. It's one of the first films where sound recording equipment has taken on location, which was no mean feat because of the sheer cumbersome size of the equipment they were working with. Housing Problems achievement in giving working people a voice had parallels on radio, which had been itself an early pioneer of documentary. When the topic of unemployment was politically most explosive in the early 30s, the BBC had invited unemployed people to describe their experiences direct to the microphone. But by the mid-30s, the BBC in London was turning away from documentary. In 1935, the BBC's licence was up for renewal. Uh, and that was a period, then as now, at which the BBC doesn't like to be making too many waves. And the orders went out, it was quite explicit, that uh, programme makers should watch it. They should try to avoid too much controversy. But Radio Documentary found a new home in the regions at BBC Manchester. The remit, you see, was that regional broadcasting should recreate uh, the way of life and represent the ordinary life uh, of the people in the region. And so what you begin to define developing in Manchester are programmes that reflect the lives of working class people, but also their ordinary um, enjoyments. One of the key figures in Manchester was the producer Olive Shapley. Appropriately enough, after a lifetime in radio, she has chosen to remain a voice. Radio was very regional in those days. We had very little to do with London. They didn't take our programmes, we didn't take many of theirs. And um, they were worried about the kind of programmes that we were doing. They were 
uncertain what we were going to say. I mean, they liked things that were scripted and checked beforehand, and we didn't do those sort of programs up here. Well, I didn't. I was at Oxford at the same time that Philby and Burgess and McLean were at Cambridge, and um, a lot of us were left-wing in our politics, members of the Communist Party, though the BBC never knew that. The sort of programmes that were going out when I joined the BBC bore no relation to life, it seemed to me. And I wanted um, people to have a chance to express themselves. I work in the cotton mill, in the card room. I've had to work hard ever since I left school. My mother and father before me. That's all there is for me. Work, eat and sleep. What else is there? If you don't work, you don't eat. I know when I was out of work for two years, I walked the shoes off my feet. And if I hadn't found work when I did, I'd have done away with myself. Towards the end of the decade, popular opinion, which the documentary movement had dedicated itself to understanding, became of critical importance. He has never flown before, but at the age of 69, he stands ready at Heston to take off on one of the most historic diplomatic flights of our time. During the Munich crisis of 1938, while the Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, flew back and forth to Europe, negotiating with Hitler and Mussolini over the future of Czechoslovakia, the government was concerned both to monitor and to manage the public's response to events. The whole crisis around appeasement and the government's strategy towards Hitler reveal the deep ambiguity in elite political circles towards public opinion, towards, in a sense, towards the mass democracy. And it seems to me that politicians were very unsure about what the public could be allowed to know and about the responses that they would get from the public in these sorts of crises. I had a long talk with Herr Hitler. It was a frank talk, but it was a friendly one. And I feel satisfied now that each of us fully understands what is in the mind of the other. There was no debate, critical debate or discussion on the BBC at this time about the implications and the consequences of Munich. Uh, nor is there any reflection of what public opinion was thinking. But at BBC Manchester, Olive Shapley drew on the work of mass observation to reconstruct reactions to Munich. I used to feel proud to be British, but now I'm ashamed of my own race. We've let them down! Never lot to be shot letting them down like that. It's a damn shame. Chamberlain's took a liberty God with help it. the Czechs. It looks as if they've been so veiled in France this time, all right. I feel very indignant about it all for once in a while. Stop Hitler now, I say, before he takes away Czechoslovakia. We don't know what Chamberlain will be giving away in the end. The uh, programme that Olive Shapley made reconstructed uh, the attitude of ordinary people to what was going on uh, at that time, and it showed clearly that there wasn't a great deal of consensus for government policy. There was a great deal of confusion, there was a great deal of uncertainty, but there was a clear sense of outrage amongst ordinary people and a sense of betrayal that our government has sold the checks down the line. Uh, and that is the only critical discourse uh, about government policy in relation to Nazi Germany that I am aware of on radio before the outbreak of the Second World War. Bold though some of its efforts were, in other respects the documentary movement never managed to tell the whole truth about the changes occurring in British society. It was the old industrial Britain that interested them, not the new prosperity of the Midlands and the South and the very different workers there. The image of the working class that comes across in documentary film is an image of skilled men, of heavy industry. It's an image of men who are heroic, dignified, working, but it's a melancholic image and it arouses feelings of, of melancholy and sadness in us because it's of a disappearing world. But of course the power of those feelings of melancholy and poignancy obliterates entirely the new forms of life, the new uh, ways of relating to each other that young women and men had in the new industries, through the new industries, through new forms of leisure activities. 
and through all the other changes that were transforming relations between the sexes in those years. That's not present in documentary. It's obliterated, it's repudiated, it's denied. Still, in a film like Humphrey Jennings' Spare Time, working people are no longer the exotic objects of an anthropologist's gaze. They are ordinary while being individual and particular. In showing the leisure pursuits of the vast majority of people in the industrial working class, Jennings shows those morally uplifting activities such as taking part in a choir, in making uh, brass band music, these standard and received images of popular culture. But then he goes, he transgresses, he goes outside that area. And what he does is to show um, a boy sitting reading a comic at the dinner table. He shows football pools. He shows people dressed up in Hollywood costumes making their own improvised music. This was judged to be scandalous because these were felt to be the tawdry, low elements of a culture that weren't worth reporting on, but Jennings did show them. And this is a milestone in terms of the way in which we understand what a popular and pop culture is about. Calling all workers. Some uh, conversation about that. Now you've all read um, Orwell who wrote to Women's Fear. I take it. Um, so do you feel like this uh, account that they're providing, um, which is that sorry, let's get the lights on. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, do you think that this account that they're providing of um, the uh, almost the, the sort of anthropological study of the northern working class that has that slight element of disgust, of, of repulsion or, or sort of unfamiliarity at the very least, do you think that's present in the chapter of Road to Wigan Pier that I got you to, 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 to read? If any, have any of you read Orwell um, before? Yeah. Is he? How do you think he? How do you think he's portraying working class life in the north of England in in Wigan, which is still sort of between Manchester and Liverpool? Mm-hmm. Yeah, old Etonian that he was, went to the, educated in the most exclusive private school, um, but a man of the left. Um, did you feel, did you feel he was unsympathetic to the, to the people around him, or sympathetic but preoccupied with their smell, as John Lawrence was saying in that clip? Oh, come on, folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what sorts of things does he do to, to portray how horrible the conditions were? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's in a way rather, you know, it's about the filth and the pollution and the grime and the, um, uh, you know, and the sort of, it's in many ways a little like Engels. Okay?